The message you're about to listen to is a message from Apostle Eric Nyamiche, the chairman of the Church of Pentecost. Apostle Eric Nyamiche preaches the gospel in its simplest form to help the believers walk in Christ and also how the believer relate with his world. This year, the message is on unleashing the church to possess nation. Join us and let's learn from Apostle Eric Nyamiche and be a blessing to the world. If you are new to this page, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on that notification bell so that when new videos are uploaded, you can have access to it. Make sure you go to our own page and check out for more videos. Thank you. Genesis 18, 17 through 19. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham? What I'm about to do, Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will bless through him. For I have chosen him so that he would direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. So that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he had promised him. 1 Timothy 3, 4 and 5. 1 Timothy 3, 4 and 5. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? Ravi Zacharias, the Christian apologist, told a moving story about a Hungarian refugee, Andras Thomas, who spent 55 years of his life in a Soviet prison. Thomas was incarcerated in 1945, but the year 2000, when things were losing up in the Soviet Union, they decided to free the hostages and the prisoners. And Andras Thomas was also considered. But they found out that he didn't look quite right. His mind was clouded. So they took him to be insane. But somehow, some of the officials decided that let us go call somebody, some psychiatrist from Hungary. Maybe he will help us. So they brought this Hungarian psychiatrist. He was with Thomas for about three days. And then later on, he explained to the officials, this man is not insane. You have messed him up in solitary confinement. He is actually speaking an old Hungarian dialect. Release him to us, and we will make him well again. The officials agreed and released him. So Thomas's frail body was put on a wheelchair. Whilst he was being wheeled out, he made his first request. And you will never guess what he asked for. Can I have a mirror? So they handed him a mirror. He held the mirror in front of his face. And he couldn't withstand the image you saw. He put the mirror down and held his face and started sobbing like a baby. For more than half of a century, he had not seen his face before. The last time you saw his face, age 20, robust, strong, young man, politically driven, looking for a better world. Now age 75, weak, frail, taken to be insane. When the true miller of God is handed over to you to look at your true face, what kind of image would that be? If your life, let's say your prayer life or your devotional life 
or how you actually live is watched by someone outside of God, what would that person think of the nature and the character of God that is in you? If your life were examined by someone outside of God, what would that person think of the nature and the character of God who resides in you, the God you profess? In 1996, when I became, when I was ordained as a pastor, there was this senior minister who wanted to do me a favor. He wanted me to come and preach in his church and then actually officiate a marriage ceremony for him. That was a very good offer. So I seized it with both hands. Started preparing towards that day. Two hours to time. I was ready. My clerical color was there. I was going to put it on for the second time. And this time, to do what I have not been allowed to do for five years. So I was holding my manual and pacing up and down, preparing for that moment. Then somehow, about an hour to time, because I was going to catch a bus and then get to the district in 20 minutes, my wife was busy trying to fix me some meal. Whilst I stood in the mirror and decided that now it is time, let me put on my clerical collar. I tried fixing it myself. Those days it was that round one. You, you, you fix it with a, a, some kind of difficulty. You needed somebody to help you. My wife was also busy at the kitchen, and so I tried to do it myself. When I'd finished fixing it, still standing in the mirror, I heard a clear voice. Is this man a pastor? Which man? I was alone in the room. He said, the man in the mirror, the man in the mirror was my image in the mirror. So which man? Whilst I was tossing this through my mind, images of the way I treat my wife started falling into my memory. One after the other, there was no, nothing, none of them that was good. Very bad images. Is this man a pastor? Then somehow I broke down in front of the mirror. Started weeping. Then when I heard the footsteps of my wife coming, I stood up and sat on the bed. But somehow, when she got in there, said, what is wrong with you? Your eyes are red. Then I said, an insect just entered my eyes. Then she said, can I, can I blow it off that so I've taken it out already? So she quickly went out trying to still do her work and get, get me some food. When she came back with the meal, I had taken off my vest. I've removed my clerical color. Why are you not going? So I'm too sick to go. I was a sick man. I was a sick man. So we decided that then let somebody go and tell this pastor that I'm not coming. So she quickly, because I said I was not well, she was the very person who looked for a deacon and the deacon sat in the bar, in the trotro and then to the pastor. That pastor Nyamicha is not coming. He is not well. It's true. I wasn't well. I was a sick husband. I realized on that day that my worth to God publicly is measured by what I really am in, the pub, in, the, in my private life. My worth to God in the public domain is directly worth to and measured with who I am really in, 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 in the darkness, in, the, in my private life. If your family life or how you actually marry your wife is watched by someone outside of God. 
How would the person describe the nature and the character of God? presentation is not to teach you about marriage and family life because I don't qualify to do that at best I can teach you how not to fail because I've been a failure in that regard before so much so that the Holy Spirit would not permit me to go and preach word that teaches us as to how to go about it our marriages are not just supposed to be successful they must speak not on behalf of Christ, but they must speak of the goodness of Christ. So I don't expect that our marriage just should be successful. So if you have not entered into the success zone, we are, we are far behind. Our marriages should speak in behalf of Christ. That is to say that Christ is in our marriages reconciling the world unto himself. See, Malachi chapter 2. I read from verse 13. Another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer pays attention to your offerings and or accept them with pleasure from your hands. Let me move to verse 15. Has not the Lord made them one? In flesh and spirit they are his. Now listen to this one closely. And why one? This is from the NIV. Because he was seeking godly offsprings. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. Now he's saying that when two Christians, man and woman, decide to marry and they come to the altar, heaven rejoices. Why? Because God knows and he is expecting godly offsprings from you. Godliness and godly offsprings. So that we don't go out there looking for people and asking them to come to Jesus. And then your child is included. That bleeds the heart of God. Those people will go out on rallies to call. Your child should not be included. So God expects that. In our union, he expects godliness and godly offsprings. It must be made to work. Now, but for us as Christians, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 is the game changer. And I want you to lift up your heads and look at me closely. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, the Bible says that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. This new creation is created in Christ unto good works. Created in Christ unto good works. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. There must be nothing of the old that should be left in your life. Because the old is gone and it must go. The new should come. The new life should come. This is if anyone is in Christ. But it is still better when Christ is in you. The Bible says that it is the hope of glory. When Jesus was born, heaven rejoiced. The Bible says when a saint is saved, heaven rejoices. Why? Because in the midst of this perverse and crooked generation, 
in this dark world, you are God's hope to shine. Christ in your life. It is God's hope of the manifestation of his glory. And I'm praying that our marriages should do just that. You are a new creation. You are a brand new man. I am an example of Christ. Created in Christ unto good works, not unto bad works. Created in Christ unto good works. We have the life of God in us. When Jesus said, the water that I will give you, it will well up in your life. Matthew said that this kingdom of God, the rule of God in our life, is like a yeast that a woman makes with a flower. Then the yeast entered every part of the flower. That is to say that it affected the flower. When Christ's life is in you, and you allow God to rule in your life, the life of God in you will enter into every being of your life, every facet of it, until 2 Corinthians 4, verse 10 is manifested. He says that, that the life of Christ will be manifested in my flesh, in my body. So don't say that Christ in me. No. The goal is not to be a Pentecost minister, but no, but that the life of Christ should be manifested in your mortal body. So that as you walk about, you become the aroma of Christ. Better still, when you and your wife throw in the community, people should peep from their windows, look at you and bless the name of the Lord and change mentalities and let people know that marriage is actually a gift from the Almighty God. We talk so much about communication. All of us are aware that communication is good for marriage. But you see, we know more than the world does. Because the source of good communication or evil communication is the heart. When the heart is bad, communication is bad. There's nothing that you can do. Because out of the abundance of the heart, a mouth will speak. An action will take place. So Malachi says that, Therefore, guard your spirit. When you have entered into a union with your wife, guard your spirit. When a word like F-O-O-L comes into your mouth, into your mind, don't let your mouth speak it out. Many times you hear people saying that, you see, we used to be very nice uh, before we married, but these days my husband does not talk to me, my wife, we don't just talk, we start a conversation within two seconds. We are quiet. It's because you have been very careless about the covenant of marriage. You have been very careless. It, you must hold it in high esteem. You see, the Roman Catholics revere marriage, and they think that marriage is a sacrament. We must look at it with all its holiness because it is a gift from God and we must handle it well. Don't be careless with words. Don't destroy your marriage with whatever comes in your mouth. Don't do that. Now, the most basic function of communication is not the giving of and receiving of information, but building relationships. Communication is not about giving and receiving of information, but building relationships. So if you are speaking to your wife, know that you are doing it to cement a good relationship. Not because you are angry, let me tell him what I think. Let me tell him my mind. You are being careless of the covenant that you have entered into. Malachi says that, guard your spirit. Don't be careless, guard your spirit. Because if you are careless, the devil will enter and you may break faith with your wife. And for us, because we eschew divorce, we tend to do stand-off relationships where the pastor and the wife endure rotten marriage comfortably. The quality of this relationship depends a great deal of what we say to one another. When verbal communication does not happen because resentment are built, it has the power to destroy. 
physically, mentally, spiritually, and eventually destroy the relationship. You can wake up one day because the woman does not feel she, she is in the husband's house because the man is always shouting and uh, using put-downs. The woman's spirit is gone. She's so depressed. She wakes up one day and this is how the body looks like. The body is destroyed. The mind is destroyed. They are insane. And now they are on drugs. When relationships don't go well between you and your wife, and you say you are, you are anointed, I beg to differ. You, you are never anointed. Because the relationship that does not go well with your wife will block the circuit in heaven. And then when the circuit between you and heaven is, is blocked, now it will disturb your receivers. You always be out of coverage area. It will be shh. The family life. The family life. For Christians, the relationship between husband and wife is more than the commitment between two persons. Rather, it is a three-sided relationship consisting of husband, wife, and God. God asks the spiritual dimension to family life and transforms the relationship into a powerhouse of strength. But listen to this one. A generational blessing is guaranteed. If the entire household is included in the relationship, you and your wife could be very good Christians, but if you want your generation to, to, to receive blessings, then your whole household, including your children, should be roped into the relationship. Don't leave them behind. Now, it is said of Edwards, Jonathan Edwards, who lived between 1703 and 1758, that somebody did a research 150 years after he is dead. At the turn of the 20th century, American educator and pastor E. Wilson decided to trace out the descendants of Jonathan Edwards, almost 150 years after his death. His findings are stunning. Jonathan Edwards' godly legacy includes one U.S. vice president, three U.S. senators, three governors, three mayors, 13 college presidents, 30 judges, 65 professors, 80 public office holders, 100 lawyers, 100 missionaries. Very great achievement. But I'm not so much interested in the, in the social ladder decline, but I'm interested on the foundation they stood. They were aware of the Puritan tradition, the non-conformists, a people that desired to please nobody but God, a people who understood what it means to be a worshiper of God. Two things the Puritan thought of a family. Number one, the Puritan viewed family as a calling. The family life, they viewed it as a calling. So Jonathan Edward, I'm sure, and his spouse, they gave birth to 11 children, yet they were able to meet their needs and bless their generation. Now listen. They had about six reasons why someone should marry. And the third one was like this. You marry to support your husband's or your wife's salvation. Look at that. Have you thought that in church before? That I'm going to link myself to my wife to support her salvation. They had all these things in their mind. And so if you decided to marry, you marry, you go into it as a calling. A calling. So that inside the calling, they believe that one is called to marry and to have children. As God's way of maintaining the race and within the race, the church. As part of they are calling, parents were expected to teach their children obedience to God and themselves, that is the parents. Children too were taught to know that they, are, they were also called, or they are also called, 
They are called to do two things. They are called to obey God and to obey their parents. This view of life as calling was expanded to other areas of their life. So the call that the, 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 the spouses enter into marriage is known as the domestic call. And then when he is a carpenter or when he works in any public arena, they see that one too as a calling. Now, when you go to Boston area in the United States, all the big universities are there. That is where these people went to stay. And then they built God and they left great legacy for the United States of America. I want you to begin to think how you can see your wife and your children, you have a ministry for them, see it as a calling. Because if a man cannot take care of his house, he is unfit to take care of the church of God. You may be fit for the church of Pentecost ministry, but don't bride in that. Because other people too are in Methodist tradition. Some are in the Presbyterian tradition. Some are in the Roman Catholic fraternity. So being a Pentecost minister should not be your goal. In the midst of all the ministers, you must be God's man. They saw family as the church and a seminary. So they saw family as a church and a seminary. Our first seminary as ministers should not be Pentecost Theological Seminary. No, it should be your home. Where the spiritual formation is, begins. The, the man is supposed to be the pastor and the assistant pastor is the wife. The man supervises, they are going in and coming out. He organizes devotions for them. And then when they come back from church, he finds out how much they have been able to absorb. And then where he thinks that there are some deficiencies, he supplies. And by that, he also wants to leave a good example so that they can pace after him. Your home should be the first church. If a man cannot take care of his home, he's unqualified to take care of the mysteries of God. Building a family altar. Now, when you hear building a family altar, you may be tempted to say that I know. Yes, I know that you know. But my, my thesis is not to let you know what you know. Keep that one. Hold the knowledge because it is important. But you see, it's not just about knowing, but it's about doing it. And it is also not about doing it, but it's about doing it with deliberation to build saints out of your children and the people in your household. When the Puritan talked about family, they were not talking about the nuclear family. It extended to anyone in their household. The apostle Paul said that, man, you must believe, and then you and your household. We must all believe in our household. Samuel was a brilliant man. Samuel stood on the platform and said, look at me. I've left, I've left you so many years. Now I'm about to retire. Speak against me. If I've done anything against you, speak it out. And nobody could say any word against the great Samuel. But let's listen to what the Bible says. Samuel continued as judge over Israel all the days of his life. From year to year, he went on a circuit from Bethel to Giga to Mizpah, judging Israel in those places. But he always went back to Ramah, where his home was, and where he also judged Israel. And he built an altar there to the Lord. He is a replica of the Church of Pentecost minister. From, from, from where? From Bethel to Giga to Mizpah, back to Ramah, your seat. But he always went back to Ramah. Let me take the chapter 8. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as judges for Israel. The name of the first was Jobel. The name of the second was Abijah. They served at Beersheba. But his children did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribe and perfected justice. 
So also the elders of Israel, so all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. How did they know it? They saw it, and we don't like what we see. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. Now, my, I am praying that history will not repeat itself. Someone lived in Eli's house. He saw it with his eyes. But he was comfortable judging Israel. And now he couldn't save the generation unborn. That is why our themes still connect to the next generation. If you really want to see a church vibrant and strong, let us be mindful of the, of the church and the seminary in our house. How do we organize and conduct a home church? Scheduled a convenient time that suits the family members. It should include music, worship, and testimony. Teach about preaching. Teach without preaching. It is a seminary. Teach them. Don't just preach at them. Teach them. Talk to God together on issues. Each member of the household should play a role. Keep worship brief, especially when they are kids. It is an opportunity to discuss other matters, issues of concern. Occasionally, set a time where the family will go on retreat. Pastor your people. Pastor your children. Let them fast. Let them fast. Let them know how to pray. Let teach them how to travel. I am praying that I will leave behind at least six boys and girls. I will leave behind these ones. So that if my church members do not listen to me at all, these ones, they are at my beck and call. I should be able to leave them behind to continue where I left off. Powerful young boys, strong and powerful, to be able to continue where I left off. If church people, some people's uncles will not listen to you, not your children. History should not repeat itself. Today, our children drag to church. And some of us, we just have to force our teenagers to come. Say, don't you know that I'm a pastor? You are destroying my ministry. You didn't begin early, but it is not too late. Relating to distant, grown-up children. Some of them too are grown-ups, but we need to disciple them from a distance. The Apostle Paul and the Johns will write to my little children, praying that their eyes of understanding be enlightened, that they will know praying for them and writing to them. Follow them up with prayer and writing. Don't leave them behind. Technology has really made this very easy for us. I want you to begin to change and look at what you can do. Now, relating to extended family, it is difficult to relate to extended family. When people were saying, calling Jesus Messiah, Messiah, his family people saw him as the carpenter's son. From biblical times, the extended family, especially the siblings, have been plagued with rivalry and all sorts of things. But you see, it is still your responsibility. The light that is in you is for the benefit of the whole household. So you can't do anything about it. And the spirit that we have received is the spirit of communion. So whether you, they have disturbed you or not, don't tell yourself, as for this, my uncles, no, not at all. Don't go to church and respect other people's uncles whilst your uncles, you don't have anything to do with them. It is our responsibility. When you are born again, God expects you to take charge and lead them. Yesterday, a lot was said about money. I wouldn't want to go that there. But you see, God created things for us, including money. And God left a shrine in our heart, where he ruled. And man has taken God out of the heart and has replaced it with money and possessions. All that the general secretary said, you will not be able to do them if you don't dethrone the God of money from your heart. It's not easy. That rich young man, rich young man came to Jesus. Jesus said, go and sell all that you have. The, the man shook his head because 
Jesus knew one thing, that the God of money was the rich young man's God. Is God your money? You, is money your God? You can't serve God and mammon. You either will please one or displease the other. In the name of Jesus, it is my prayer that we dethrone the God of money. And let us enthrone God so that all other things should be outside of our heart. They are supposed to serve us, but not we to serve them. Let me conclude with this statement. We also need to teach our, man, our children about money and possession. Let them know that money is hard to come by. You need to work hard to get money. Don't be materialistic. Be simple, as we heard yesterday. Teach them to give, learn to give, and to pay their tithes. Teach them very early. And then, you see, there must be consistency in your life. Consistency in your life. Your children will be looking at what you, you do. And they, they want to imitate you. There must be that consistency. Your children will look at what you do. One man has said, there are only three ways to teach a child. The first is by example. The second is by example. And the third is by example. There are only three ways to teach a child. The first is by example. The second is by example. And the third is by example. Especially when we profess to be ministers and we do certain things wrong. Our children find it very difficult to accept it. They will pardon the carpenters and the bankers, but not you. In conclusion, D.L. Moody said, A man ought to live so that everybody knows he is a Christian. And most of all, his family ought to know. A man or a woman ought to live so that everybody knows he is a Christian. And most of all, his family ought to know. God bless you.